I'm Jeff Jarvis. I'm the director of the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism here at CUNY. Uh, our dean, Sarah Bartlett, would be here to greet you, but she's flying back from ski slopes, lucky her, for a brief and well-deserved, uh, I think, two days off. Uh, is and, and Andy Abramson is our, our associate dean, so we, we send you our welcome from CUNY and uh, welcome to this event. Andy, Andy Mendelson, I'm sorry, I have another friend named Andy Abramson, sorry. Um, um, Andy has just arrived from uh, Temple, so we're glad to get him to New York. Uh, so, accuracy. Um, it's hard to turn just a couple stories into a trend and a crisis, but I think we'd agree that we've had some uh, significantly embarrassing issues with accuracy in our dear field recently, and especially Sarah Bartlett thought it would be a good idea to have this event and, and talk about what we can do about this and to keep this on our agenda. Obviously, as a journalism school, it's always on our agenda, but we have new circumstances we want to talk about here. We had an event about a year ago that, uh, underwritten by Craig Newmark in fact checking and uh, in talking about, maybe more than a year ago, I think, uh, Craig, uh, and, and talking about new mechanisms and new means and new standards for fact checking. But this is a little bit more about um, accuracy as a whole in reporting now. And we have a couple of case studies lately that we probably won't necessarily go into tonight, but obviously the Rolling Stone University of Virginia story is a big issue. We at CUNY had an episode recently where an Atlantic story uh, about the university uh, was answered with a lot of uh, challenges from the university about the information and data in that story, and Atlantic corrected a lot of that story. I, I don't know that Brian Williams and Bill O'Reilly are necessarily a part of this, but they could be in, in larger issues of trust. But what really strikes me about tonight, and the reason we wanted to do this, is that we are in a time of basically fact checkers are almost extinct as a breed. It's, it's, a, it's a tragedy, it's a crime, it's a waste, but it's a reality we have to deal with. Not only that, we have fewer editors by far. Um, uh, pardon me, this one little plug, but I, I wrote a little book called Geeks Bearing Gifts. Uh, I'm not, I won't sell it to you, you don't need to buy it, because it's all going up for free on Medium. And the latest chapter I just put up was about the need to find new efficiency in the news business and, and, and how we find those efficiencies. And so I will piss off various people, it's not for the first time in life, because I argue in there we've got to do an audit of what matters most in journalism. And we have to decide what it is we most must protect in this time of vulnerability in our industry. And what are we trying to keep as we go forward? And of course, I would argue that's first and foremost reporting. Um, people I'll piss off in that piece, you know, I ask is sports journalism central to that or not? Is uh, entertainment journalism, central to that or not. Uh, I think when we grow again, it is, but at the core, what do we do? And I said this too. I said that I don't know that we can necessarily afford copy editors the way we could. And I used to be one. Um, and I was very grateful to all the editors who protected me from humiliation many, many times in my career. Um, and I don't want to call it a luxury. I want to call it a necessity. But if you were a city editor or a managing editor of a newspaper in a mid-market in this country, and it came time to decide what you could do most with the small staff you had in a digital world where you're constantly in the crush to do more and more and more, I suspect, more often than not, you'll go for reporting over editing. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but what I am trying to emphasize tonight is that's a reality. That's where we are. Add to that, of course, the fact that those of us who blog have no eyes, except the public's, to pass over what we have done and to save us from mistakes and, and, and embarrassment and idiocy. So the bottom line here is that more stuff is going out more often with fewer eyes on it before it gets to be public. And that clearly has an issue for accuracy. Now that's not the case, I don't think, with the Rolling Stone and the Atlantic story. They have editors and they, are, and they, and they produce, both are great publications that produce a lot of great stuff. And fact checkers too. Um, so there's vulnerabilities in the system about how we operate, about how we try to get stories. There's lots of factors that go on. But at the end of the day, uh, we thought it was necessary to have this event. Sarah Bartlett uh, uh, really inspired this because it's not so much that you want to argue that a few stories makes a trend in a crisis. But we do have to be aware of where we are in the business right now and that accuracy and trust matter greatly. I'll say one thing last. I'll plug Craig Silverman's book, I regret the error, and Craig was nice enough, or he may regret this, to, to have me write the foreword for the book. 
And as I thought about having to write that, um, and it's a, it's a great book, by the way. I recommend it highly. Uh, Regret the Error, Craig Silverman. Uh, as I wrote that, I thought about what I had learned in the blog world, where, we, where I don't have an editor, where, where my blatherings go out unfiltered to the world, where I do mess up, and people do quickly and eagerly, uh, and with great schadenfreude, correct me. And I realized that, that, that when I came up through the business, it was a, you were ashamed of admitting an error. You tried to hide from the error. That's what we did, because we had this myth almost of, per, of perfection. But I realized in the blogging world that every time you correct your error and correct it publicly and openly, you don't diminish your credibility, you raise your credibility. And how we deal with errors is, I've learned a lot from Craig about. How we deal with errors tells us as much about what we do as what we do in our original work. We have to get better. We have to figure out what we're doing with our original uh, uh, reporting. And we have to figure out where to go from there. We have to figure out also how we deal with errors. We have to worry about our trust and credibility in this world. So uh, my colleague, Hal Straws, who is the, um, the manager of Everything Tau Night, uh, put together this entire event. And I'm grateful to him for doing that. So I'm going to pass it over to Hal now. And uh, we'll have a great discussion. Last thing I want to say, see I lied, it wasn't the last thing before, is that this is meant to be a discussion. This is not a case where we have brought the answer to you, and here they are. Quite the contrary, this has to be a robust discussion that has to continue on and on and on uh, about how we figure out better means and methods, better standards, better ways to get greater accuracy in our journalism in this new world. So Hal, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Didn't know you were a copy editor, really. I'm sure you did great work. Um, I, I don't have much to add to that, except to say this, it should be pretty obvious to everybody here that you guys know more about this problem than we do, uh, and than Jeff does, than I do, even than, than some of the folks here on the panel who are real experts uh, when it comes to accuracy and the ways that newsrooms and individuals can, can uh, try to do a better job. So I hope that as the event proceeds, you'll take the opportunity to, to, to you know, call bullshit when you know, somebody here says something that isn't quite right. That, that wouldn't be any of these guys, but I don't know. Jeff may talk again. Um, <laughs> please, please raise your hand. We'll be, uh, we'll be flailing around with microphones. Tell us what you've experienced, what works for you, and I guess most importantly, you know, where you see things really breaking down, because that's the only way we'll, you know, we'll effectively focus on, on the solutions and uh, hopefully avoid being roadkill in the, in the future. Uh, the first panel is on a bunch of, uh, are, is on the ways that organizations and uh, media companies, such as they are, can go about encouraging accuracy by their policies, by their technologies, by the people they hire. Um, and it's going to be moderated by Markham Nolan, who's just a, a, a longtime thinker about uh, the problem of accuracy and mistakes, who's uh, the managing editor of Vocative. Uh, and has to, you know, where he, he oversees a, uh, a staff that often is, is producing without a net uh, and really, really understands this topic and I'm sure we'll have lots of interesting uh, things to say. Markham? Thanks very much. So thank you all for, for having us here. I'm going to stay seated here with my colleagues and before we dive in, I want to have them introduce themselves. Uh, we're very lucky, lucky to have four people here who have a really interesting range of experience. Um, I come from Vocative. I work uh, four blocks down the road. I'm now a managing editor there. I came from Storyful, where I worked with David, um, and where I have uh, run into Craig numerous times. And I'm fascinated by what Chris does at his um, at his uh, place of work, which is Genius. So I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves, and we'll just go through what we're going to do for the rest of the, the session. Craig, me? All right. Hi, uh, I'm Craig Silverman. Um, I, Ten years ago, I started a blog called Regret the Air that looked at corrections and accuracy in the media. Um, I did, did a book of the same name, as you now know. Um, and uh, currently, in addition to still doing some work on that blog, uh, I'm a fellow with the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia, where I've just finished a research project looking at how news organizations cover online rumors and unverified claims and how they debunk misinformation. Uh, and I'm also uh, the founder of a real-time rumor tracker called Emergent.info, where we look at circulating rumors online 
um, and try to determine what's true and what's false. And I'm David Clinch. I'm global news editor at Storyful. I worked at CNN for 20 plus years. I am an editor. I've never ever been a reporter. In fact, I'd be a terrible reporter. But uh, I am an editor, was an editor at CNN, quit about five years ago to join Mark Little, who had founded Storyful, which is the news agency of the future. It was five years ago, so what does that make us now? <laughs> we're, we're, the st we're the news agency of now. Uh, uh, and the, the goal there is that, uh, in the simplest terms relevant to this uh, panel, is that you either can or cannot do journalism in real time. And in a sense, that's a choice. And the choice that we made when Mark founded Storyful when I joined is that you absolutely can and that you should and that you must and that there is no excuse for not doing journalism in real time. The particular kind of journalism that we do is verification of content, video uh, images, information that is being used by all of the major news organizations around the world and here in the US uh, is being pulled from the internet in real time instead of just using it and hoping for the best we verify it, make sure it's real, and we also make sure that we know who owns it and get them credit, and in some cases, money as well. And I'm Chris Glazik. I'm a former fact checker at The New Yorker, where I fact checked pieces like, like Jay Mayer's piece on the Koch brothers, and if anyone remembers that. Um, I once let an error get into the magazine that estimated that there were eight, 80 billion chickens in the world, and there are only 8 billion, so it's a by a factor of 10. That's what the agriculture, agriculture department told me, but I guess I didn't, I didn't think about it hard enough. But <laughs> anyway, that was like my big failure as a fact checker as a New Yorker, but I did not get fired for that for that lapse, and I was there for several years. And I'm now executive editor at Genius, which is uh, an annotation platform and tech startup whose ambition is to cover the entire internet with an extra layer of commentary and information. And I'm very interested, um, as a former professional fact checker, I'm very interested in amateur fact checking. I'm interested in how fact checking can be a part of the reader experience and actually a part of the interactive experience of journalism. <clears throat> okay, so the other element to this is you guys, the audience, uh, the people who are watching via live stream, but mostly the people in the room. So I want to get a sense of who you are because you're going to be uh, quite a big part of this. So a show of hands, how many of you are actively working in the media as a reporter or an editor? Oh. Okay, keep your hands up. And anyone, who, anyone whose organization has a print version, take your hands down. OK, wow. so we've got a really, <laughs> really interesting mix. How many of you are currently satisfied with the amount of hands that copy goes through at your organization in terms of keeping it fact-checked and accurate? Wow. OK, so not very many hands at all. Um, how many would agree that? That that's a huge problem that, yeah, you want, want more <laughs> hands. Okay, so more hands are going to go up. I think we can establish that. So what we want to do, or what I want to do with this, with this group is with, I'm going to talk to Craig first. And what I want to ask Craig is um, about creating a culture of accuracy. So what does it take when you bring people into a newsroom, when you bring new journalists in in particular, to create uh, a culture where accuracy is really important to them? Um, I'm going to share a quick anecdote, and I won't bore you with any, any stories from my life of, of woe in journalism. But um, I've always worked in places where there's not much of a barrier between me and the audience. So there's not many hands. Small newspapers, websites, places like Storyful, where you have to self-edit before it goes to an editor. And there was one time, it was my first year as a newspaper reporter. I'd worked in magazines before that, but my first year as a news, re news reporter out of an MA. And because of the pace and the size of our new room, newsroom with only three reporters on duty, there was a story for the front page the next day about an Irish scientist who had a, a large part to play in a NASA rocket being launched. It was a, it was a satellite that was being carried up, and we had, we had someone, a homegrown guy, who we were all very proud of. So I interviewed him. We did the piece. The editor said, let's write it up as, because the, the launch was literally 10 PM. I was going to be gone home. And I get a call at 9.55. My story has gone to bed. It's been edited. The rocket is a dud. It's not going to be launched. And the editor has basically tasked me with making sure that this, this story is ready to go. And I have to call him up and hang my head and go, the rocket didn't launch. We can't run the front page story. You've got to find something else. Now, that's pretty terrifying when you're like a junior reporter. And if anyone here has made a mistake 
of, of anywhere similar to the, the magnitude of that, you know what it feels like. The pit of your stomach is just horrendous. It's, it just feels awful. Um, they were very grateful that I put the hand up and said, we can't get this wrong. Uh, I knew I couldn't do that because we'd be a laughing stock. I'd be a laughing stock. How do you get a young reporter coming into a newsroom now to appreciate that? Because I had a deadline. I had a paper that was going to press. Everything I said was irretractable had it gone onto paper. What can we do to, to drill that into news reporters who come into a world where if you put something up and it's published, mm -hmm. you can actually go in and change that straight away if you want to. Right. The consequences aren't necessarily as dire if you're quick to catch stuff. Should that be the case, or should we be fostering a desire to get it right first time? Yeah, I mean, the, the culture piece is, is really important. And it, it sounds very vague, I think, at first when you talk about, like, well, what's a culture of accuracy? But it's made up of very tangible things. So, like, you know, what, what is the message being sent from leadership in the newsroom? Is the message that frequency and speed, you know, the amount of content you produce and how fast you get it up there, is that what's being valued the most? Um, is traffic more important than other things? And so those cues, even if they're not saying, hey, I don't care about you getting it right, or I don't care if you ask the extra question or take the extra few minutes to see where it came from, if you're, if you're valuing certain things and then not articulating accuracy and other things like that, then people start to get the message in a newsroom. So leadership plays a, bi a very big role in that. What are they communicating about what they value, and then also what do they reward? So in, in your scenario, I don't know what the reaction was of your editor, but ideally, if you're going to have a culture of accuracy, the editor should be, well, that sucks, and I'm disappointed, sure, but also grateful that the reporter steps up. And so what are you rewarding in that sense? Are you rewarding the person who got the most traffic for the thing that actually turned out to be kind of a hoax or what have you? Or are you rewarding the people who actually didn't publish something? Because that's very difficult to reward, obviously. You don't get any value for something you don't publish. It's hard to kind of feel that in a tangible way. So the values piece is important. Another piece um, that I think, especially for people coming into a newsroom, that's really important, uh, well, two of them, um, habits and communication. So on the habits piece, um, what are individual reporters and editors doing on a daily basis, every single time? What are the habits of the newsroom, tangible things that people do that reinforce accuracy, that reinforce values around that? Um, you know, one habit that is a great accuracy enabling habit, for example, is when you interview somebody to ask them to give you their name and their title every time. Uh, and is this something that is talked about in the newsroom? You know, are there habits around, if you don't have editors who look at everything, are there habits around getting people to look at each other's copy, for example, or asking questions of each other? So communication sort of relates to that in a big way. I think that um, you know, verification accuracy, in many ways, they're very much team sports. So if people aren't helping each other and talking to each other, if editors aren't asking where did that come from, um, if people aren't, if they don't feel free to actually speak up and say, here's the piece I'm not so sure about, then, you know, then you're not going to sort of surface these things. So the values, the habits, the culture, the communication are all really important. And then in really, really tangible stuff, obviously um, you can't talk about accuracy without talking about errors, and so corrections come into that. And what's the culture around corrections? Uh, Jeff mentioned an element of shame. And this is very common in newsrooms. Um, you know, the idea of making a mistake is so intimidating and so shameful that oftentimes when people do make mistakes, the first reaction is to minimize it and to hide it. And, and since you are able to, in the digital realm, go into the CMS and change it and resave it and pretend like nothing happened, then if you have this culture in there where people aren't talking about the importance of accuracy, they aren't asking questions about what they're gathering, they aren't sharing habits. They aren't seeing stuff valued from the highest level in terms of getting it right or not doing something instead of doing something and having it turn out wrong later. Well, all of that sort of starts to bleed down into concrete actions like scrubbing away errors. Uh, so some signifiers in newsrooms, you know, is there a corrections policy? What's the workflow for corrections? Because you can have a policy, but nobody actually does anything around it. Uh, these are all pieces of a culture of accuracy that has to exist in newsrooms. And I, I honestly think that one of the most, you know, the two, the two really important elements are one, what, it, what are leadership valuing and what are they rewarding in terms of this kind of action around that? Um, do they talk about what your value is in speed versus accuracy? Do they talk about the value of ma making corrections and reinforcing that trust? Um, because, you know, again, with corrections, it seems really counterintuitive, but the more you're willing to admit your errors, the more people trust you. It's kind of the paradox of trust, that people know we're going to screw things up, and we will screw things up, 
but if we're not willing to admit them, then they don't know that they can trust us. There was can, a, can I interrupt yeah. you there, right? Yeah, I've yeah. got a question. If, as a writer, and this goes to everyone in the audience, if, as a writer, you knew that if an error was made in something you put online, that it would stay there and a correction would be either added to the top of the article or something else, there would be another signifier saying, the person whose byline is on this story got it wrong. Here's where they got it wrong. Would you be like less likely to get it wrong? So if you agree that you'd be less likely to get it wrong, from the outset, put your hands up. Wow, no, no one, no one really believes that. If, if, let's, let's talk about that a little, right? So Deadspin, I don't know if you've seen this piece, Deadspin did this great piece, which they thought was a great piece, on a politician who uh, apparently was inflating his claims about being a football player. Um, Craig, I think you wrote about this one. Yeah. And they very quickly, it was, it was debunked by not only the politician's uh, team, but also local papers. Uh, pa a photo of him in, in football gear came out. And there, the main person that the sources they relied on just totally reversed his testimony, T hung them out in the breeze. Deadspin left the story there. They wrote a note at the top uh, giving right of reply to the campaign. They then had an editor's note at the top of that to a story that's, that was titled, How Deadspin Fucked Up, the, the, and linking to the rest of the title of the original story. That's a huge thing for the journalist who wrote that initially, a massive shaming, but probably quite a healthy thing. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, so a couple of things about the way Deadspin handled that. So number one, the note came from and was signed by and clearly written by the editor-in-chief, Tommy Craggs. So again, that leadership piece, he didn't put it on the writer, he didn't, and, and it's also relevant to the Rolling Stone thing. Their source completely recanted. They had been told something and the source recanted. Unlike Rolling Stone, their reaction was to say, no, 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 we fucked up. Um, Rolling Stone initially said, well, our, our trust in the source was misplaced. So they're taking ownership of it, the editor is signing it, and then the other thing that they did, which was really good, is Deadspin often makes fun of the media, uh, especially sports media. And he made it very clear uh, in there that, you know, because we do that, um, and I'm sorry, it's getting very vulgar in here, but I'll repeat what he said. He said, you know, because we do that, we really have to eat shit on this one. And he, he wrote that. Uh, and so, like, it's really clear when you read that, that they know they really screwed it up. There's no trying to minimize what their role in it. They're not blaming somebody else. The editor is out there. Um, and then they also wrote it in a way that I think reflects to their audience. Like their audience would read that, and that's the way Deadspin talks. So they didn't use some kind of weird robotic language to try and minimize it. They kind of like they leaned right into it. So I thought all those things were good. You know? I, I would say on that subject, I think that in my view, there's sort of three levels that you need to look at. One is that like, right at the beginning of the process when you're doing a story, um, before you get to the, what's written and what the consequences are, I think you need to deal with the, you know, what used to be in the news industry called trust but verify. Really, 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 truly needs to be ingrained as trust nobody and verify everything. Because I think that the, the, the issues that arise in stories like that are often because something was written and based on something that you know appeared to be true, maybe even had two sources, you know, gelled with other information, and it sort of got to that point where it just was believable, and then the story went from there. And I think that, you know, Storyful, but I think a lot of other news organizations too, now look at that and go back to the writer and say, don't just double check it, triple check it. You know, just because the person is believable doesn't mean that it is true. And just because the other person is believable doesn't mean it's true. Is there a way to triple check? Because I think that if you, if you ingrain that sense of don't trust anyone, and obviously that includes don't trust the government, you know, don't trust even maybe sometimes your own reporter or your own instincts, you know, double, triple check everything is something that I think is not instilled enough in, in writers and publishers. And then I think after that's done, and hopefully that eliminates a lot of the early issues and problems that could come, if you then do encounter problems, I think that we're all saying the same thing, that there needs to be uh, not a carrot and stick, but maybe a stick and a carrot approach. Like the stick is there should be consequences, not necessarily horrible shaming, but th there must be some sort of consequences from above. But I also truly believe there has to be a carrot, and not just a carrot for getting high numbers and getting your views or whatever, but a carrot in the sense that you are rewarded and shown to be rewarded and, and accept, accepted as a journalist if you do fuck it up and you do, you do 
the right thing by coming out and saying I made a mistake. And I don't think there's enough carrot. There's definitely not, a, probably isn't enough stick. You know, there, there, there are some institutions that we could name but we won't name. There's no consequences for getting it wrong. You just rub it out and keep going. Most news organizations, there's a stick, could be more. But I'm, I, I really would like to see more acknowledgement of the fact that sometimes people really get it right by compensating for what they got wrong. Well, I mean, acknowledgement is one thing, but I, you know, in, in a context of unlimited resources, triple checking sounds nice, but does, yeah. do the economics of the industry actually permit that? You know, I mean, do they permit a fact-checking core at the, at the institution? Um, barring that, d d does a reporter have it the time in the day to actually triple check every source? Does any, does any content come out if it's being that carefully dealt with? I mean, I, I think it's interesting what, what, what Jeff was saying before about how uh, publications can actually enhance their reputation rather than diminish it by acknowledging that sometimes they fuck up. I mean, do we also need to, uh, you know, I mean, one version of that is actually we need to raise our tolerance for, for fuck ups, but have a better system for, for dealing with it when it happens. And, you know, to invite readers to, to join in too, to help fact check and participate in the process. And that maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. But. Well, and one of, one of the mm -hmm. points there about sort of the or origin of a story to me is always like with, with the, uh, you know, the story in the university and other stories that have come up recently, one of the things that was a factor there was that it was the, the information was accepted under the basis of the person not identifying themselves, right? And I think that that's a real issue to me. That's, a, that's when you do need to double and triple check because you're basically telling the audience that the trust is entirely on you as the journalist because they don't know who the original source is. And I would say that's the case for uh, you know, that's the case for lots of things. I'll, I'll get back to it in a minute of, of video and the way we deal with video is that the carrot for that, for me, is that if, you, if you're going to do a story with an anonymous source or if you're going to run a video when you don't really know who owns it, you know, there are consequences for that. But the carrot to me is how much better will your story be if you get the source to, to acknowledge themselves, at least in some form. I, I know there has to be anonymity sometimes, but how much better is your story and will your story be if the source comes out? And certainly, you know, if you're gonna run a piece of video, how much better will it be if you actually know who owns it and you can talk to them and get the whole context? So I think that that's the other part of it that isn't emphasized enough is there is actually a really good journalistic reward that should be there if it isn't there already to not accepting you know, anonymous sources and not accepting that you're going to run something when you don't know the whole story behind it. So let's talk a little bit about the carrot is kind of a hard thing to define because your carrot, a lot of the time for web journalists in particular, the, the carrot is your views. And that's yeah. what a lot of people care about. Unfortunately, that is the way it is. And that's increasingly how companies measure bonuses. It's how they reward people is based on traffic. Ideally, you don't want negative traffic. but the counter doesn't dis discern between the hate read and the great read, so you'll take them both as they come. When it comes to the stick, what do you think the consequences should be? So if you get something wrong, how many strikes do you get? And I think I'd like to throw this open to the audience here. What do you think? Should, should journalists be fired? Should uh, journalists get a, uh, should it be on a sliding scale depending on how willing they are to to acknowledge their uh, acknowledge their mistakes and make corrections, or is it a is it a is it a is it a one strike rule? You're out straight away when you fuck something up on a. Oh, thank you. Um, I feel like there should be like a strike, but not so much as to, there needs to be levels of the mistake. I feel that proving that you made a mistake and re and redoing. What you, what you did wrong should be looked at. Because if you say, if you put that out there, you make a mistake, you're fired, then it's just gonna cause that journalist to, to be scared of what they're putting out there. It's gonna put fear, and that's the main problem why people are hiding their mistakes, because they fear that their job is gonna be put on the line. Yeah. So I, don't, I believe in a strike system, but levels to how, what type of mistake you made. So how about this? I think I think it's fairly harsh for people to be fired in the first mistake. That would be my that would be my take on it. Yeah. Probably doesn't happen either. Probably it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? How about if you were given a tool by which people could see your workings and could um, we're talking about a, a concept of maybe radical transparency. So if there was more of a window into your workings and how you got to your your end published piece, would that make people more motivated to either draw people into the process or get it right all the way along. Now, 
Let me give you an example, two examples. Um, back, back in my days at Storyful, we, did, uh, we pioneered a thing called the open newsroom, where stories that we couldn't fact check ourselves, we decided to do in public on a Google Plus newsroom, where we allowed certain people in, and we allowed, we allowed everyone to watch. So it was an open conversation with a select group of journalists, acknowledging the fact that we didn't have all the facts, and uh, inviting other people to collaborate. So that was one kind of thing where it was, uh, it was like a one-way mirror into the journalism that was being done. The other thing that you could look at potentially is how many people are familiar with WordPress or, let's start with WordPress. Who's used WordPress in the room? Okay, so everyone's familiar with WordPress having a revision history in the back end. If you knew your revision history was going to be as public as the finished article, how would you feel about that as a journalist? Because what you're allowing people to, I see people shaking their heads and like closing their eyes going, no way in hell, man. I don't want to see, have people see my scratchings at the start and the fact that I can't tell it's from my apostrophe, <laughs> IT apostrophe S. Um, if you were to publish that, though, that would show people journalism's a messy business. We got it wrong at the start. We gradually honed it down to the article that we pushed public. But here's the process, and we're happy with that. Here's the, uh, I'm, a, I'm a reporter, by the okay. way. Okay, but isn't, uh, I feel like the re problem is less reporter motivation, like we all want to get it right, uh, and more failures of editing. Well, remember a, a lot of, well, no, I mean, well, a lot of places sure. don't have editors looking at stuff yeah. before it goes up now, though, no so. No editor at all. Yeah, well, sometimes. Sometimes I, there's a backstop where it goes up and then people come and look at it after. It, you know, it'll like differ in some cards. places. But I, I don't disagree with you, because I think that, you know, my experience at CNN and Storyful, and, and I'm, you know, have the lucky benefit of being sort of in everybody's newsroom and seeing how, you know, Vice does it and ABC and BBC, and just, I see how they all do it. And I think they all have editors, and that's, that's good, but maybe different levels. I think my take on what Markham is saying, though, that is a really well-written piece should tell you enough about the process, including what the editor has made you add, like, how did you know that, and why did you say this? And, and that will reveal enough of the process that I don't think you should necessarily intrude on the sort of reading and reading experience by having this sort of you know, multi-layered thing published. Not that it shouldn't be available, necessarily, and maybe that's where annotations come in and things like mm -hmm. that. But, but if, if it's a well-written piece, you show enough of your process. And I totally, completely agree with you that editors need to make pieces better and you know, prevent some of these problems. But I think that the fundamental thing I'm talking about, the sort of trust nobody kind of thing, is that if an editor says to a writer, you know, how did you know that? And the, editor, the writer says, well, because my source told me, and doesn't even get the source as far as their editor, which is apparently what happened in some of these things. Like the editor doesn't even see who the source is. And that's, that's you know, and go back to the point that was made back there is there are rules of journalism and then there are cardinal rules of journalism, right? And I think almost if you break the cardinal rules of journalism, you almost should be fired. Or if you're the editor, you should take full And if you lie to your editor, right, the editor exactly. has no power, Making right? a mistake is making but a mistake. But the editors at Rolling Stone well, I'm not going to get personal about it, but you know what <laughs> well, I'm saying. Well, you know, in that in a case, where in that I case, think, you know? I think most journalists would recognize that there's a difference between making a mistake. I didn't know this. I didn't understand it. I didn't mm -hmm. ask enough questions. Right. And then what I again, I would call. Maybe we need to write down the cardinal rules again, because there are cardinals, and I don't think they've changed. Why have they changed? Just because it's faster? They haven't changed, and that to me is you know almost on the edge of fireable. You know, not necessarily the journalist writer being fired, but if I was the editor, I'd fire myself, right? Because that's a cardinal rule. Let's go. <coughs> Here in the um, so to me, it sort of comes down to the atmosphere in which um, I guess mistakes and accuracy is uh, is valued or perceived, um, because in if you're working in online media versus newspapers, it's completely different. Um, for me, insta uh, for instance, in my uh, profession, I have to do six to eight stories a day. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it just comes down to, are you constantly, as I guess, as editors, are you constantly referring to traffic and numbers and getting your stories up, getting the content up the fastest first, and the retweets and everything, 
or are you talking about accuracy? And if you're constantly talking about the former, then it seems sort of unfair to, ex to expect 100% perfection on the latter. So there's a saying in, in Harvard Business School that you can have, you can get grades, you can get sleep, or you can have a social life. There's three things, pick two. Yeah. You can only ever have <laughs> two, right? Yeah, right? And in journalism, I think it's you can be factual, you can be profound, you can be quick, but you can only be two of those at the same time. <laughs> Right? So you can be factual and you can be profound, but that's going to take you a long time. You can be factual and quick, but it's not going to be very profound. And you can be quick and profound, but there's not going to be any facts in it. It's just because you're a like. profound person and you've just thrown something out there. So it very much, I think, depends on your newsroom and what, your, what the value set is, what you're trying to go for. So you can't mm -hmm. expect all three. Yeah. <laughs> well, but expect all three. I, I would argue, just very briefly, I would argue that you, you can in a way be all three, in the sense that I think that sometimes the pressure is the wrong kind of pressure. I think you can publish very quickly what you know, and then you can add to it. I think That's the true. problem becomes when it, the idea is, you got to, I want the whole story now, and in order for it to get the traffic, I want a sexy headline, and the sexy headline mm -hmm. isn't backed up by what's in it, and you end up with a basically inaccurate story because it's a, a, the headline is what everybody sees and it's not backed up and eventually the story you know ends up an emergent and it you know <laughs> it, it gets taken taken down or corrected i think you're never going to avoid errors completely but one way to avoid that is to try to sort of chew off too much in this real time world that we live just say, say what you know write what you know and then add and you know be more profound and add things later on is is a better way to do it so many of the errors that happen are people just overwriting stories and adding things that just aren't there? I mean, and I would say too, and, and invite others to, to help you round out the story Absolutely. as well. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the problem occurs when you start pretending and you kind exactly. of present this false veneer of this like seamless, totally done thing when, when in fact it's not done. Maybe maybe there are these mm -hmm. holes, these aporias that you can kind of you know that, that can be a jumping off point for interactivity it doesn't, yeah. that doesn't have to be except the end of the thing except for one other cardinal rule i absolutely hate articles that have a question mark in the headline <laughs> like saying did so and so kill so and so question mark and then the article really doesn't say that they did it so i and, I and by the way research has shown that the way people read the question innuendo headline is they process it as true and then afterwards <laughs> they append it so people who have actually studied that so don't do that Ever. it's very bad yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so on the subject of the, uh, you know, the carrot and the stick and so on, um, I'm interested in, in the fact that you're describing some suggest, some of you are suggesting solutions that are very meta, very kind of text heavy, you know, clue people into the process, the whole, ter and I have to say as somebody who reads things all day long, right, that I, the last thing I want to do is read more process pieces related to the piece that I'm reading, et cetera. But I do want some access to, um, let's say, the track record of the reporter. And I would be interested in seeing uh, where you, know, you can glide over a byline and it's simply something as simple as, as like a baseball stats. You know, they've had 33 <laughs> times at bat, right? 33 stories. They've had six errors. And I'd like to see that for the editor. So the editor has even, mm. I mean, even if the editor's not really reading stuff, there's somebody with the title managing editor in most of these organizations. And 600 stories have gone out under their watch over the last month, and there have been 300 mistakes. I mean, that just on a basic level, I mean, with the reporter, for instance, at Rolling Stone, it was not her first time at the, you know, this sort of mistake rodeo, and it would be important to know that. Secondly, I would like to just suggest, too, that what you have is um, a lot of times with the examples you guys have given that we're not really talking about, there, these are agenda-driven stories. And I can tell you, as a former editor in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the University of Virginia is located, that the source on the story in the Rolling Stone uh, debacle was well known on campus as being, well before Rolling Stone got there, as being somewhat delusional, somewhat unreliable. In the community, it, the, it was, well understood that she was not a reliable source, but Rolling Stone, by its own admission, really had an agenda to write a story of a certain kind, and there was, there was duplicity with their attempts to fact check, 
the emails to UVA, didn't, you know, checking things, left a lot out. And I, I think that there's more and more yeah, of and that I mean, going, you know, happening that could par perhaps be a panel unto yeah. its own. Well, I, and I don't disagree because I think one of the other issues is that the line between sort of the publisher and the consumer, the reader, is also eliminated, I believe, or has to be eliminated because there should be now, with so many different sources, so much news coming from everywhere, there has to be a much greater burden on the reader to doubt and to question the things, especially things that lead with some dramatic headline and you know, come in maybe obviously agenda driven. I mean, I would say that you know, there needs to be a level of sophistication in the audience to, especially when they're anonymous sources and those kinds of things, that, 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 that's not putting the burden on the audience as opposed to the journalist. But I think we do have lots of different kinds of publishers now who see mistakes and errors in a very different way than were maybe seen before. And I think that that, that creates a problem, but also maybe not a solution, but it's definitely part of this burden also needs to be on the reader. As a reader myself, I find myself second guessing and doubting far more than I used to in the past. And, and readers want to do that. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's part of what, what publishers are recognizing too, that the, 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 there, there's an aspect of the readers want to have a seat at the table. Right, yeah. and they, they, they want they want to to be able to grab onto something, and this kind of like, uh, you know, classical ideal of kind of like the editorial experience, which is this seamless thing which entirely washes over you. Yeah. People aren't as interested in that anymore. But they want something they can grab grab onto. Yeah, but maybe Craig, you could talk about the question of. I think we're all assuming the audience cares. <laughs> Does the audience care? Because this is one of the biggest questions that's out there right now. Do, do, I, do they give a shit if there's a mistake or not? I mean, do they care? But before we dive into that, I have one question for the audience, which is, again, show of hands, how many of you have read something on Wikipedia ever? <laughs> how many of you have gone into the history of that piece and asked questions about the sources, how it's been edited, who's been editing? <laughs> Handful. So this goes to your, your uh, question about can you, can you get the stats for an editor or a writer and who's had their hands on it. Wikipedia do that. So if you go into um, any Wikipedia article, up at the top you'll see a couple of different things, talk, history, etc. <coughs> if you go into the history, you can see every single edit made on every single Wikipedia page with the username for the person who made the edit, you can click into that person's edit, see what other stories they've edited, and it's, an it's a place you can lose hours and hours of your time, but it tells a fascinating story about the topic, who has what kind of interests, what motives they might have based on what other stuff they've worked on. It's a really interesting thing, and I think that there's, there's certainly room for, um, for that to be brought into journalism. The Wall Street Journal did an audit recently, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, I remember it uh, came from Raju Narsetti that I saw it, on the mistakes they made and the corrections that they issued in the last year, which was really fascinating. But I would say that the fact that the audience here, a room full of journalists and people concerned with journalism who haven't ever questioned Wikipedia pages <coughs> is really interesting to me because we're talking about how much we care about accuracy, yet no one seems to have challenged where the, the information of Wikipedia can has come from. Can I, can I use an example and sh show something really quick? So I just want to, so I, I wrote a story for the New York Times Magazine recently about this very controversial art dealer, and I released an annotated version of the piece like about a week later. Is this here? I think it's here. So, and, and one of the things I did in the annotations is I basically addressed a lot of the stuff that I lost in fact checking. We also have to say um, that's one of the best magazine portraitures <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> like, that's an amazing photo with the story. So, so, you know, during the fact checking process, there were some facts that had to go away, and some of the stuff, you know, I felt mad about because, like, I thought it was right, and I wanted to, to put it in, and I wanted to explain what happened during the checking process, actually bring the checker into it. So one thing, just, this is a simple thing, but this guy I, we describe here as an industrial scion, and I wrote, you know, I originally had industrial heir, but Sim Kavitz's father claims to have disinherited him. Now, I didn't believe that he was actually disinherited. There was something where the father was like, he's not getting any money, or something like that. You know, so we changed heir to scion. And then Sim Kavitz, the subject, actually got on here himself <laughs> and started you know, talking back. He said, there's no claim of either or. This is patently incorrect. And so I said, OK, well, we had heir. And then in checking, you said that wasn't true. So which is it? Are you a scion? Are you an heir? And then this just kind of allowed him <laughs> occasion to bloviate. So clearly, you have an interest in real estate prices, the value of my father's home, cars, continue reference to my BMW throughout the article. So it's like, uh, you know, and, and then a reader goes on and says, okay, he's, you know, <laughs> I guess coming, coming to my aid there. 
But so, you know, th this, this was a way that the kind of like fact checking and the, and the dispute over what the, the precise fact was, instead of having to totally gloss over it, I mean, which we did for kind of the general reader, here we were able to go into detail and, and actually get all the parties to the table. And you know, something in terms of what someone was saying, like, well, we don't want to read any more process stuff. You know, th these, two p these two versions have different audiences. You know, there's kind of like the, 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 the version for the general reader who has a casual interest in the thing, and then for the people who really, really fucking care, you know, people in the art world, people who know the protagonist, there's this annotated version, which kind of gives this whole extra layer of detail, which may not be appropriate for a general reader. And, and, and it's also this kind of occasion for those that really want to drill down, you know, to whatever. So for those of you who aren't realized, Genius are working on a version where you can put genius.com slash and the URL for any site Near, nearly all sites, and you, you should be able to annotate that site, which is a fascinating thing because it allows anyone in the world to take a web page and just do their own fact checking. So for the Rolling Stone right. article, you could have gone in and said, well, this source is known, um, and share that with other people so that they can join in the fact checking process, which is both amazing and terrifying as a journalist because your stuff can be picked apart in front of everyone in situ on the page not down the bottom in the comments section, but in line. So every single fact. Yes. And then how you deal with that. So, so recently, there's an article in Bloomberg about uh, this like mysterious explosion of an oil pipeline in Turkey. And there's speculation in the article about whether it was cyber terrorism. And then these war studies professors from England just got on there. They went to the URL. They typed genius.com slash before. Creates like an annotatable version of the thing. And they went through line by line, kind of demolishing the argument, you know, but in a pretty friendly way. It wasn't that hostile. And you know, I was like, oh, well, can we get the reporters involved? I asked the law prof or the, the security staff professors, like, oh, the reporter knows that we've done this. He's not happy. You know, I don't think that he wants to you know, get involved. And you know, that's a mistake for, for the reporter, I think. I think the reporter can get back on there. Because not this stuff wasn't so cut and dry. And that's another thing I want to say about rating reporters in terms of how many errors. It's not really like an error is an error is an error, right? It's a continuum. So, so, you know, and, and, and that's why something like this can also be helpful, because sometimes an error does have to be a discussion. Sometimes it's not just a, a, an act. Yeah. And I, I think that gets into the whole carrot area again, is that in most cases, discussion of what you've written actually improves and enhances what you've written in most cases, even if it does point out that in some cases you were off. And I think we need to be very careful about distinguishing between something that is an egregious error something, a journalistic error, and what I would call a mistake, right? I mean, I think errors are you were wrong and you should have known you were wrong, right? Because if you did the right thing, if you followed the right steps, you would have known you were wrong. And a mistake is a mistake. We're humans, we're, you know, some of us are humans and journalists, and we make mistakes. But I mean, to give a completely lighthearted other example that I, I want to illustrate something here is uh, what will probably appear to be a completely random video A guy in a boat who all of a sudden gets visited by a giant hippo, right? And the reason I'm showing you that video is that we at Storyful take great pride in the fact that we help all of the news organizations around the world get videos like this that they can run every day and make lots of money by running them on their monetized platforms. But we also take huge pride in the fact that we want to be absolutely sure that the video we provide is the real one, it's not fake that the person who's distributing it owns it, and that they get credit or money or whatever. And this is a perfect example of an amazing video that was actually out on the web on Facebook for about 12 hours or so, with this guy had posted to Facebook with this really completely believable story of him being in the boat, and he was there, and his background on Facebook was he lived in Africa, and there was no reason to doubt him at all. He had this great description, except for one problem. He was full of shit. <laughs> it wasn't him, it wasn't his video, he had found it on the internet, and he republished it very cleverly with this entire description. And whatever his motivation was, it was uh, no. <laughs> whatever his motivation was, a lot of news organizations not only, I mean, some of them just ripped it off and used it, as they always do without even asking. But the ones who asked, he lied profusely to them and said, yes, it's mine, and you can use it. Make sure you credit me properly. And then when we started to question him, we said, this is great, but it's not a very high quality video. Can you send us the original video? Can you send us some proof that you were there? And the more we asked, the more dodgy he got. And then by coincidence, we saw a comment, interestingly, on his Facebook page from somebody saying this isn't his video. And we went and followed that trail and found the original video. And Mike is in the corner there and is going to tell us the story. He works with ABC. Uh, Go ahead. 
I didn't know you were here, by the way. So. I, saw, I saw it. We used it. Um, and uh, th this is one of those examples of uh, when I saw him tweet that, I was, I was livid. Um, and it, I didn't mean to call you on this. I no, seriously no, it's didn't. Fine. It's, I'm, I'm this glad is you brought it up because this is an example of a real life situation where newsrooms across the world put this video up. You think you have the right person, and if you just do a little bit more digging, you get to the actual person. So I was, I was livid when this went up because we take great pride. We work with Storyful. Um, we take great pride in our social news gathering. And when I saw this go up, I was just like, one, I started questioning. And so then I started questioning everybody in our news organization who worked on the video. How do we get to it? And you do, you take a lump. That's why I'm okay with talking about it. it uh, I agree with the fact that what you guys say about you have to own these things. Uh, we got it wrong um, on this one. But it did allow me to go back through and train some more people, uh, train some more people, talk to them. What did you do wrong? How can we not do this right. wrong again? Right. Um, and, and, and a mistake it, is important. a mistake, right? This is not an egregious error. That's a mistake. But uh, on the other hand, and uh, this is really illustrative, too, of what Mike is talking about, once it was w realized, and we, did, we could have been and should have been faster and better, but when we did eventually realize who the guy was, not only do we then have the video and the right guy, who actually made thousands of dollars out of the video, good for him, he also is then part of the story. And I think even ABC went back, and I know the Weather Channel and others went back and interviewed the guy, and he was an amazing part of the story. So this is the carrot thing that I'm talking about, is that mistakes happen. And if you make a mistake, I've made mistakes, you own them, and you, you know, I once said at CNN that an African leader was dead because I mistranslated decide from decide or whatever, and <laughs> you know. Turns out he was dead, but nevertheless. <laughs> Everybody makes mistakes. But so own your mistakes. Errors are a different thing. Errors are when you just have a systematic process in place that ignores the can canon rules, right? And then the other part of it is if you make a, whether it's a mistake or an error, you're missing in a way, I believe, you're missing also the opportunity, if you get it right, to get a better story. And I think that's what's de-emphasized all the time. It's like it's better to get the story out and you know, hope that you're right or it'll, it'll end up being right than it is to think about how much better the story will be if you are right. Can, can um, I make one last point on the stats? Yeah. Um, so there are some news organizations, not a lot, but some that are actually tracking errors um, internally. Like New York Times has a database. When there's a correction being issued, they say, you know, was it a reporter error, uh, an, an editor error? What kind of error was it? I just finished a consulting project for a news organization where I used a Google form and a spreadsheet and created one for them and they're now gonna have their own error database. So people are using that in some news newsrooms and it's not about punishment because that's really important, it's about training. It's to say, listen, you've been spelling names wrong now. Uh, you weren't doing it three months ago, you're doing it now. You're getting this wrong, you're getting, you know, it gives you intelligence to actually create a prevention program that's data driven rather than just telling people to get it right because it's, that's not enough. You should actually go and work with people and figure out where a weakness is. So. There's some places doing that. If anyone wants my template for how you, how you do that, I'll send it to you for free, happy to do it. But even, it's even something you can do individually. Figure out what mistakes you've been making and then figure out what kind of process you can change about how you do your reporting to get it right. So we're gonna wrap up, but I wanna, I wanna say I'm quite impressed with Mike and ABC and how they handled it. I think one thing that you, we can all agree on is that when, that every mistake is an opportunity down the road to teach the rest of your team how not to make that mistake in the future. Uh, so we can take each one and make it a teachable moment. When people come to you through comments or annotations and they point out a flaw in the story, depending on how you react to that person, they can become a source. It's, it's happened a lot of times where you turn an angry commenter into someone who actually becomes mm -hmm. one of your greatest allies in that area because it's the people who comment and the people who point out your errors and your mistakes are the people who are most passionately engaged with that subject matter. Uh, if you can figure out and you can skill, skill up your team to deal with those in an engaging way, they can become the most valuable people to you. Mm -hmm. And that's why you need to mind the comments, listen to your readers, admit your mistakes, post your corrections, and teach the newsroom that a uh, mistake is something that hopefully you only do once and you don't repeat, but you can teach the rest of the newsroom for the lifetime of your organization on the back of it, and they're not to be feared.